Hello, welcome to COVID chat number eight. I'd like to read from Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter eight, verses 33 to 34. Paul writes, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession. For us, I'd like to just say a few things about the subject of assurance, assurance of salvation. Verse 34 of Romans 8 begins with these words, who is he who condemns? It is a, uh, this is a defiant expression of assurance of salvation. But what is the basis of this assurance Paul expresses? Well, the confidence Paul expresses is based on Christ and his saving accomplishment. Who is he who condemns? And then really in the original text, the first word, the word that comes immediately next is the word Christ. Who is he who condemns? Christ is he who died. Further is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now notice that all four of the things that he mentions about the work of Christ have to do not with Christ's work in us, as important as that is, but with Christ's work for us. It is Christ who died, making full atonement for our sins. Furthermore, it is also, it is Christ who is also risen, as we're remembering, especially tomorrow. He is risen from the dead, confirming that his sacrifice was sufficient and accepted by God. It is Christ who is even at the right hand of God, he mentions, the supreme place of acceptance and authority, having successfully finished the work that the Father gave him to do. And it is Christ who makes intercession for us. Now, that last one, if there's any lingering fear that though I may not presently be condemned, I could still be condemned in the future, this last aspect of Christ's work that Paul mentions should effectively expel that. Perhaps an Armenian friend comes along and says, well, yes, it's possible to have a present assurance of being in a present state of salvation, but it's not possible to be presently assured that you will always be saved and that you will finally be saved in the last day. It is possible, he might say, that a true Christian might fall away and apostatize and therefore be condemned in the end. Well, I would say to that, what kind of assurance is that? And what do we say to this man? Well, among other things, we say this, who also makes intercession for us. Now, what's the connection? Well, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus not only offered up himself as a sacrifice for our sins once and for all on the cross, but having been raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he ever lives now in the holy place, the true holy of holies, where he makes intercession. He represents us before the Father. He makes intercession for all who come to God by him. And what is the end secured by our Lord's intercession? Well, Hebrews 7.25 says it this way. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. The end secured by our Lord's intercession is salvation to the uttermost, or uttermost salvation. In other words, he is able to save completely and to bring us safely all the way to glory. This is the end secured by the ongoing intercession of the resurrected Christ for his people, a resurrection that is based on our Lord's finished, all-sufficient, substitutionary, curse-bearing death for our sins on the cross. So this assurance, here's what I want you to notice, this assurance that the apostle expresses in this text and argues, is arguing that it belongs to every true Christian is an assurance that is derived from gospel facts and realities that are totally outside of himself. He says nothing about himself, nothing about who he is, about what he has done or what he hasn't done, he says nothing of what he feels or doesn't feel. He looks away from and out of himself to Christ and his work 
for us, and there he rests his case. And my dear friends, this is the primary source. This is the taproot of assurance of salvation. When it comes to reflecting upon our, our state before God, we must be careful not to put all the emphasis upon the evidences of grace. We talk about the evidences of grace. We're talking about the marks of the new birth, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the, the evidences of God's work in our life, and the graces of the Spirit that are produced in us. Now, those things are important, and they have a role to play in encouraging and strengthening our assurance. But we must not so focus upon the marks of grace and the evidences of grace while neglecting the objective foundation of our assurance, which is in the gospel itself. This was a great problem in the Reformed churches in Scotland at one point in history. Ian Murray mentions a typical example of this given in the life of Robert Haldane. One of Haldane's contemporaries, a man by the name of John Campbell, was a man who came to be much used of God, but before that period of greater usefulness, he was locked up in a kind of morbid introspection, an imbalanced, morbid introspection, and he, could get, and he, and he had no assurance of his salvation. We read, quoting, for many years he had known and believed the truth, but his views of Christ had been rather sought in the reflection of the inward work of the Holy Spirit in his heart than in the contemplation of the finished righteousness of Christ, and he had neither peace nor joy in believing. At last, to use his own earnest words in a remarkable letter published by John Newton, he said, the cloud which covered the mercy seat fled away, Jesus appeared as he is. My eyes were not turned inward, but outward. The gospel was the glass in which I, be I beheld him. I now stand upon a shore of comparative rest, believing I rejoice. When in search of comfort, I resort to the testimony of God. This is the field which contains the pearl of great price. Frames and feelings are like other comforts passing away. What an unutterable source of consolation it is that the foundation of our faith and hope is ever immutably the same. The sacrifice of Jesus, as acceptable and pleasing to the Father as ever it was. Formerly, the major part of my thoughts centered either upon the darkness I felt or the light I enjoyed. Now they are mainly directed to Jesus, what he has done, suffered and promised. Well, my dear friends, this is the starting place. This is the foundational root of assurance of salvation. I let all my fears and doubts and uncertainties drive me afresh constantly and repeatedly to Christ and to the realities of the gospel, to his work for us as my only secure trust. So, and I come to him saying, as it were, nothing with the hymn writer, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Spurgeon gives this very helpful illustration, and with this, I'll end this COVID chat. He says, a great monarch was accustomed on certain set occasions to entertain all the beggars of the city. Around him were placed his courtiers, all clothed in rich apparel. The beggars sat at the same table in their rags of poverty. Now it came to pass that on a certain day, one of the courtiers had spoiled his silken apparel so that he dared not put it on. And he felt, I cannot go to the king's feast today for my robe is foul. He sat weeping till the thought struck him. Tomorrow when the king holds his feast, some will come as courtiers happily Excuse me. Some will come as courtiers, happily decked in their beautiful array, but others will come and be made quite as welcome who will be dressed in rags. Well, well, said he, so long as I may see the king's face and sit at the royal table, I will enter among the beggars. So without mourning, because he lost his silken costume, habit, his silken costume. He put on the rags of a beggar, 
And he saw the king's face as well as if he had worn his scarlet and fine linen. Spurgeon then goes on to make the application. My soul has done this full many a time when her evidences of salvation have been dim. And I bid you do the same when you are in like case. If you cannot come to Jesus as a saint, come as a sinner. Only do come with simple faith in him, and you shall receive joy and peace. What an excellent word from the Prince of Preachers. May the Lord richly bless you. Goodbye.